Okay, this section is vectors in space. Now, again, I think I've mentioned this in one of the previous or multiple previous um, chapter 10 videos, is that it really is just an extension of everything else that we've learned about vectors, except now in space means you're talking about three-dimensional figures versus vectors in a plane, which is only two dimensions, okay? So it's basically two components versus three components, okay? So everything in this section will have three components, okay? And so just like the way you find the position vector in the plane, it's the same way in the space. So you find the end um, first component minus the first, or the end x value minus the beginning x value, the end y value minus the beginning y value, the end z value minus the beginning z value, okay? Um, and you can also write it in I in the unit vector component, except I is a unit vector going in the positive X direction. J is the unit vector going in the positive Y uh, direction. And then C is a unit vector going in the positive K direction, okay? Um, so if you have a point P and Q, three-dimensional space, so three variables, X, Y, Z, it says find V such that P is the initial point and Q is the terminal point. So P is where I start and Q is where I end. So then that means if I want the coordinates, it's gonna be five minus negative five, six minus two, and then five minus four. So I get um, positive five, positive four, and positive one, okay? So then V in component form would look like, um, not parentheses, right? Parentheses are for points. This is a vector. So five, four, and one. Or if you want it in its I, J, K form, you don't really write one when it's just one. You just write the K. Okay. Now it says for a vector in three-dimensional space, we kind of already talked about the magnitude. It's just the square of each component and then the square root of that sum. So for this one, the magnitude of V would be the square root of two squared plus three squared plus negative six squared, which would be the square root of four plus nine plus 36, which is the square root of 49, which is just seven. Okay, now for two vectors, we also have the same rules as before. I did mention this in another video. This is just them writing it out. So if you're going to add two vectors, you just add the first components, the second point is the third components, whether it's in the IJK form or whether it's in component form. To subtract first component, Subtract the first components and the order matters, right? If V is in the front, you take V's component minus W's component and so on and so forth for all three components. Um, and then for the scalar multiple, you're just taking that scalar and multiplying it by each component. So it says, for example, three, you've got V equal to this, W equal to that, find five V minus W. So we're trying to find five and I like to use component form um, plus three, negative three, four, negative five. So I get um, five times two plus three times negative three, five times negative four plus three times four, and then five times three plus three times negative five. And so then what do I get here? I get 10 minus nine, which is one negative 20 plus 12 is negative eight. And then 15 minus 15 is zero. And so that's what I get for five V minus or plus three W. Now it says find the magnitude of the difference. So the first thing I wanna do is first find the difference and then I'll find the magnitude. So that means, um, the same vectors, so two, negative four, and three, take away W, which was negative three, four, and negative five. And so then I'm gonna have two minus negative three, which is actually two plus three, so I get five, 
four, negative four minus four is a negative eight. Three minus a negative five is the same as three plus five. So I get positive eight. Then if I want the magnitude of that subtraction, it's just gonna be the first component squared plus the second component squared plus the third component squared. So 25 plus 64 plus 64. Let's see what that is. I get the square root of 153. Now that's not perfect. So that's just going to be the answer unless they want the decimal, they give them the decimal. And then finally, they want me to use the same views and Vs from example three, just to do the subtraction of the two magnitudes. So more than likely it's not gonna be the same number. But let's verify. So then the magnitude of V is going to be the square root of um, 2 plus negative 4 plus 3, because those are all the components of V. Um, there's the components of V. And then minus the square root of all the components. I should put a square. I didn't put squares. All the components of W. So 3, negative 3 squared four squared and then negative five squared. And so we get four plus 16 plus nine. Here we get nine plus 16 plus 25. So I get the square root of 29 minus the square root of 50 and this is the exact form, but if they do ask you to round it, then just take and put it in the calculator. And I get that it is like negative 1.69. And so it depends on whether or not they want this or this as the final answer, okay? So, we also have a definition for the unit vector in three-dimensional space. It's literally the same definition, except now you have three components. So if I wanted to find the unit vector for this guy, I would have to take V, I'm gonna use component form as always, over the magnitude of V. So negative four squared plus four squared plus two squared And I get square root of 16 plus 16 plus four. So 16, I get the square root of 36, which is six. And so then if I divide each of those by six, it's gonna be negative two thirds positive two thirds and then negative one third. And this is going to be the unit vector that I'm looking for. Now, dot product also extends to three dimensional space. So if you've got the dot product, you're just multiplying the, the respective um, components and then adding those scalars together. So then again, the result is a scalar. So when you take the dot product, you get a scalar. So then here, let's put this in component form. We have negative one in front of I, we're missing J. So you have to put a zero. And then K is a positive one. For W, we have one for I, we have negative one for J, and then we have a positive one for K. So it's very important that if you do are missing a variable that you fill it in because you do have to have three components when there's a K involved, okay? Um, and so then if I want to find V dot W, V dot W, that's gonna be this dot with this, which means I have negative one times one, which is negative one, plus zero times negative one, which is zero, plus one times one, which is one, and eventually I just get zero, okay? What does that tell me about V and W? Remember, if the dot product is zero, it tells you that they're orthogonal, right? So V and W are actually perpendicular to one another. Now, it says another rule, this theorem also applies to three-dimensional space. So there is an angle between the two vectors. 
no matter which direction they're going in space, there's still an angle that connects them. And it can be found using the same exact formula that we used in the two dimensional space. So it says, find the angle of the vectors or find the angle between the vectors in example seven. So let me just put a V in component form from example seven. And then W in component form from example seven. And then let me find the angle between them. Now they're supposed to be orthogonal, right? Because we got zero for the dot product. So I am assuming I know that the angle is going to be 90 degrees. But let's go ahead and follow that theorem. So theta equals the cosine inverse of the dot product over the magnitude of V. and the magnitude of W so that's the cosine inverse of and I already found the dot product it was zero over the square root of two times the square root of three so um, theta equals the cosine inverse of zero over square root of six which is just cosine inverse of zero and the cosine inverse of zero is 90 degrees. And we know that already because we knew they were orthogonal because the um, angle, but because the dot product was zero, okay? We already knew this was gonna happen. But you might be asked to do a problem and it doesn't come out to be 90 degrees. So you definitely need to be able to follow the rule, okay? Now, just like before, when you had two components, you could have written a vector as the magnitude times cosine alpha plus cosine beta. Now here, you can extend that to three-dimensional space. So it'll be cosine of alpha, cosine of beta, and then cosine of gamma, okay? And they're gonna be uh, angles with respect to the other, um, the other unit vectors. So this is going to be an angle. So that's going to tell you basically your um, horizontal position. This one's going to tell you your vertical position. And then, and it's actually not like that because the XYZ plane is different. So this will basically tell you your forward or back position. This one will tell you your left or right position. Um, and then this one will tell you your up or down position. Okay. Um, so in order for us to find these different angles, it's a little bit different than in two dimension because two dimension, they use sine and cosine of the same angle. So this one's a little bit different. But I'm gonna use the formula that they gave me and just go with it. So I know that V has to equal the magnitude of V times all of this. So what the heck is the magnitude of V? That's gonna be negative six squared plus nine squared plus negative two squared, which is 36 plus 81 plus four. So that's 121, which equals 11. So then I know that V in component form is this, and that's gonna equal 11 times this thing in component form. That's gamma, alpha, beta, gamma. And then if I distribute my 11, I get 11 cosine of alpha, 11 cosine of beta, and 11 cosine of gamma. And so then in order for this to equal this, I know that each component must be equivalent. which means that negative six over 11 equals cosine of alpha, nine over 11 equals cosine beta, and negative two over 11 equals cosine of gamma. Further, I know that alpha will equal the cosine inverse of this fraction, beta will equal the cosine inverse of this fraction, and gamma will equal the cosine inverse of the last fraction. And so then let's see. Now I have cosine inverse of negative six over 11. Oops. 
I get alpha equals 123 degrees. And then you can see it there. I could take cosine inverse of nine over 11. I get that beta equals 35 degrees. And then cosine inverse of negative two over 11. And I get that gamma equals 100 degrees. So that is it. Now remember, this is not creating a triangle. It's just creating a segment. So don't think that these have to add up to equal 180 degrees. They do not, OK? Um, they just don't. So there we go. That is how we calculate that. Okay. So that's the end of this section. Again, everything was just extended. This is really the only new concept was this rule up here at the top. And this is really all they're asking us to do with it, okay? Not anything big yet. They will get into all that when you get to Cal 3. They will you know, expand on this some more, talk about its relevance, all of that when you get to Cal 3. But for us, we're done with this section.